Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Although I'm a, per a professional churchgoer, which means that I get paid for going to church, <laughs> I still know what it's like to walk into a church, maybe for the first time, maybe the second, even third, and to be a little bit out of place. I am um, functionally an introvert in an extrovert responsibility, <clears throat> which means that whenever I go to a new setting, like a, like a church service, uh, someplace new, it's a little scary. So um, a couple of years ago, I had a weekend off. It was after a really grueling week, um, and I was by myself, and I went to uh, church by myself. Now, I really wanted to sneak in and to sneak out as easily as possible, but it didn't work out that way. Because uh, somebody in their infinite wisdom, whether it was a pastor or a worship team, they put this guy out in front that was, like, super welcoming. Um, he must have known everyone in the church, which meant that if he didn't know you, well, then you must be a first-time visitor. And so here it was, I show up, and he greets me. I mean, he doesn't just greet me. I mean, this guy makes me feel like I'm the most important person in the world. He introduces himself, he, he's got his hand out, he's got his arm on my shoulder, he asks me my name, he asks me where I'm from, he didn't ask me what I did professionally, but he made no assumptions. Um, he, uh, he said, now we're a Lutheran church, which means we worship kind of differently. And he brought me into the sanctuary, and he found a seat for me, and, and he sat me down, and there were three women in front of me, uh, they all had blue hair, and he said, he said, whatever they do, you do. So he said, if they, um, if they sing, you sing. If they stand, you stand. If they fall asleep in the store, you wake them up. <laughs> and with that, he left. I don't remember a thing of that worship service, but I will never forget that man. He was incredible. Well, maybe some of you came to worship this morning wanting to sneak in and then sneak out. Or maybe some of you have been around here for a while, but more like me, you're kind of an introvert. Well, today I'm going to make you uncomfortable. Today we're going to try something that's um, a little over the top. In just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to find someone in this sanctuary you don't know. Now, chances are there's someone here you don't know. You, you might have been here your whole life, but still, there are people in this sanctuary you don't know either at all or very well. In just a moment, I want you to find somebody, and uh, I want you to talk to them. And, and here's the thing, you're going to take three minutes, no more than three minutes, and uh, you've got one question to ask and to answer each. The question is this, if you could talk with anybody for an hour from history, except for Jesus, who would it be and why? Okay? So you've got three minutes beginning now. Go ahead, find somebody that you don't know. And I'm going to ask you next to um, reveal your deepest, darkest sin that you've ever committed. I'm just joking about that. But you will have a chance to talk again just a, in a few moments. I hope that wasn't painful. I, I hope that wasn't a, a negative, negative experience. Because you understand that um, deep down, kind of the essence of the Christian faith is about uh, this notion that, uh, that God loves us and that we are then to love one another. And something that I, I don't think that we or most churches do really well is learn to love by getting to know people. Um, because it seems to me that the first step in love is 
liking and getting to know and to understand the history and to experience life together. So this was just a, a brief moment giving us an opportunity to try something like that out. Now this Sunday is the last Sunday of this uh, worship series that we've been doing, um, asking ourselves how do we build a better church and we've identified some key um, places that need attention and this I think, in my humble opinion, is the most important, that, that we need to learn to love one another. Uh, love is at the, at the heart of who the people of God um, are and, and what we're all about. And I'm not sure that we're ever going to get it right, um, but I do believe that, that the time is right for people learning to love. I mean, let's face it, we, we live in a time that's very segmented. I mean, people live in all sorts of categories. And I don't know if it's just because I'm getting older, or maybe it's becoming more and more the case that, uh, that there are more barriers that exist between people, and that there are factions that seem to go at one another. And some of these factions even happen, you know, in the church. You know, we've got the conservative versus liberal, and we've got pro-life versus pro-choice. We've got Second Amendment rights versus gun control, and we have, you know, um, Gay versus straight. We have uh, Raven versus Niner. We've got all of these. <laughs> We've got all these little factions that exist. And, and the problems with these categories and with these groups is that that they have a hard time, harder and harder time, of looking beyond their barrier to learn how to live together, let alone how to love one another. I, one of the sharpest criticisms of people outside the church, of people inside the church, is that people inside the church are angry and judgmental. And so not really categories that would be described in love, would they? So now if you Google words love and God together, do you know how many hits you would find? You would find 2 billion, 250 million different sites for you to explore. There's something symbiotic about love and God going together. They, they exist together for a purpose. John, in his first epistle, tells us that uh, God is love. I think that's one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. God is love. Importantly, of course, to say that love is not God. We can't make that mistake. But this God of ours is love. God's basic characteristic, God's basic identity, when you strip everything else away, when you remove all the other adjectives to describe God, God is love. That's what God does, it's what God is, and that's what we can expect as God operates in humanity for all eternity. We discover the depth of God's love. As God decided to, to come to the world to save it because he simply loved it. And so out of love, God sent a love letter in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the human embodiment of this divine, of God's love. And Jesus comes among us and he says those great words. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. As you have loved one another... So I will love you. Is that really what it says? As you have loved one another, so I will love you? It doesn't say that in the Bible. If it said that in the Bible, I think we'd all be in trouble, right? Because we have a hard time loving one another. We might like some people, that we're never going to love them. And even those that we love, we kind of have on a short string. We get tired of them, and they get on our nerves every once in a while, and we cross them off our love list. So thankfully, Jesus doesn't put any conditions on his love for us. His love comes to us unconditionally, without request and without warrant, and he simply asks that we would love one another. But if you think about this a little bit more, it gets a bit tricky, doesn't it? Because Jesus doesn't say this is a good idea, he doesn't say, I have a strong suggestion for you. No, he says, this is a commandment. You've you got to do this. You've got to love. It's not going to be easy. Loving people is not easy. More than we would like to admit, we, well, we're like people who, um, like this woman who goes to the doctor because she has these really strange symptoms. And the doctor does a whole set of tests on her. He comes back and he says, I've got some bad news for you. you. You have rabies. And she starts to write something down on a piece of paper, and the doctor asks, what, 
what are you writing, your last will and testament? And she said, no, I'm, I'm making a list of all the people I want to bite. <laughs> we have those lists, don't we? We, we, have, we have an idea of specific people or groups of people that we just don't like. That they've heard us or they stand for something that, that we don't stand for and, and we don't like them, we don't love them, and we are out to get them even. Why does Jesus give us this commandment? Why, why couldn't Jesus just simply have said, okay, now I love you, I want you to go to church every Sunday. We might be able to pull that one off. Or why didn't Jesus give us the commandment, I want you to read the Bible every day. Maybe we could do that. But instead, he, he gives us the seemingly impossible command. Why does he do that? Actually, one of the great reasons why Jesus gave us this command, I think, is because we can't pull it off on our own. You're going to need help loving people. You, you don't have enough love inside of you to love people who are difficult to love, let alone even those that are easy to love. <coughs> You're going to need to be trained. You're going to need to be parented. I mean, people who study early childhood development will tell you that kids that grow up in families where there isn't a lot of love you know, where parents have conditions on their love for their children, uh, parents who have high expectations of their kids, higher than those kids could ever experience. Those are kids that oftentimes grow up to be adults that are scared, that are frightened of the world, that are sometimes paranoid. But kids that are growing up in families where there's a lot of love, where mom and dad, they show that love and they nurture easily, and kids grow up to be rather well-adjusted adults. Well, what's true in earthly families, I think, is true in spiritual families as well. I mean, that command to love is a daunting, daunting command. But the strange thing is that the more that we allow ourselves to be parented by God, the more we hang around Jesus and develop this, this deeper relationship with Jesus, the more we begin to learn to love like Jesus. It takes time. There's this guy, he, um, he moves into this beautiful house. The only problem is, out in the front, in the right in the middle of the, of the yard, is this great big granite boulder. And he thinks it's an eyesore for the community. So one day, he goes out there with his hammer and his chisel, and he begins to chisel on this great big granite boulder. And he does this day after day after day. Years go by. He's still working on it. Finally, he's finished. And it's a beautiful statue of a deer that's leaping in the air. And his neighbor comes to him and says, how did you carve a deer out of that great big piece of granite? Well, the guy said, I, I just simply chiseled away everything that doesn't look like a deer. So I ask you in your life, what, what needs to be chiseled away in your life so that your behavior, your attitude, begins to look more like the loving kind that Jesus has for us? I mean, if you have anything in your life that doesn't look like compassion or empathy or mercy, well then, with the help of God, you start chiseling that away. If you have pockets of resentment and bitterness and envy and pride, I mean, if you have a tendency to gossip a lot, then with God's help, you begin to chisel that away. I have to tell you that I've been taken to task with this message this morning. This past week, I had um, somebody I was pretty close to really disappoint me, do something that really, really hurt me personally. And, and my first reaction was to, to say, you know, you dirty dog, we are done, that's it, no more, no, for, no future for us. And then, wouldn't you know, I had to sit down and prepare this sermon. I had, to, I had to read the Bible, I had to study these passages where we're told to love one another. And it's like God was saying to me, okay. You can't preach it if you don't practice it. And I hate when God does that with the sermon that I'm preaching. It causes me to really take a very personal look at it. So from that standpoint, next week I decided we're going to be preaching about wives love, love your husbands better. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that uh, at whatever ability we have to love people right now, it's not even close to where God wants to take us. Even if we had a room full of Mother Teresas, and we have a lot of Mother Teresas and Father Teresas in this congregation, even so, we're not close 
to having that perfected love that God desires for us to have. And God wants to, to shape us and to mold us so that the love that we have for people begins to look more and more like the love that Jesus has for us. But, but I would tell you that I think there is an even deeper reason why Jesus gives us this seemingly impossible command. It's because, well, God knows there is no power on the face of this earth equal to the power of love. There isn't nuclear power, there isn't tidal waves or tsunamis or earthquakes. Nothing can compare to the power of love. Love has the ability to come into a heart that is cold and to warm it and to change it. Nothing else has that power. I mean, those of you who are parents know well enough that if you want your kids to grow up to resent you, then you lay the law on them. You, you force them to do things they do not want to do. You make their lives incredibly difficult by heaping upon them expectations that are unfair. The law, it can be helpful in keeping us out of trouble from time to time. But if that's all we experience, then we become bitter and resentful. And nobody changes for the good because they have been weighed down with the law. No. Love. Love has the power to sneak into our lives when we least expect it, and to reorient the world, and to change a situation, and to cause a person to surrender to the goodness of God. That Sunday that I was traveling by myself, that I was visiting that Lutheran church, that I was ushered into worship by this extremely welcoming individual was one of the messiest weeks of my life. I had been confronted with a challenge in the church that was totally depleting me. I was also being faced by um, some accusations that were crushing me at that time. And so I was really struggling, wondering not only what do I do in this situation, but do I even want to do this anymore? So I go to church with a bad attitude. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to have it out with God. And then, in walks this guy into my life. And he does not know me, but he shows me the love of Christ in a way that I needed to have shown. And it changed everything. Literally, everything in that moment changed in my life. And that's why I think Jesus said, Love one another. Love is radical. Love will change your life. And that's why it says 27 times in the New Testament, love one another. And that's why St. Paul spends nine verses in the 12th chapter of his letter to the Romans, giving example after example after example of what love might look like when it's lived out in a church setting. It's because love, unlike any other power in this world, can creep into lives, not only bring transformation, but hope and peace. And God has given you that gift to work that power in the lives of others. So once again, I'm going to invite you to return to that person you spoke with just a few moments ago. And I'd like for you to come up with one idea each on what this church or any church could do better to love people. You have two minutes this time, go do it. Right, those who are near you.